This time in my notebook, I found reference to possibly one of the most important aircraft in British history. Now, some of you might know our history teller's story about Maurice Wilson, the man who tried to climb Everest. Well, in that story, we talk about how he got to Everest by flying. Uh, and we usually have to brush over this in our live show because we don't have time to talk about it. But that flight in itself is an epic tale. But I'm not going to talk about the flight. What I've got in my notebook now is some information on the aeroplane he chose. For those of you who can't remember, Maurice Wilson decided it in 1933 he wanted to climb Mount Everest. And his plan was simple. He was going to fly from London to Mount Everest, where he would crash about halfway up and walk to the summit. Hooray! There were a few problems for Maurice though. One, he couldn't fly. Two, he didn't have an aeroplane. Now he could learn to fly and he could buy an aeroplane. And that's what I want to look at right now. Now, if you were going to try and fly to Mount Everest, what aircraft would you use? I mean, this is a journey of maybe 5,000 miles. What would you go for? Me personally, I would choose something that could cope with the weather conditions. I'd choose something with maybe twin engines that was reliable and safe. I would go for a closed cockpit that would keep out all the bad weather and keep me nice and snug. And I'd go for something big enough to carry all of my equipment I would need to climb Mount Everest. Back in 1933, that would mean you were looking at something like a Douglas DC-1 or maybe a Boeing 247. Both of these aircraft fit the bill perfectly, but there's a problem. Wilson couldn't fly a twin engine aircraft. His license didn't cover that and he wasn't able to afford to buy such a large aircraft. He had to think smaller. So single engine it is. I'd still go for something pretty stable, something that was easy to fly. Again, enclosed cockpit would be perfect and something nice and modern that could cope with the distance. Again, in 1933, Cessna were doing some great choices, a Model A Cessna or maybe their DC-6. Both of these aircraft would have been able to do the journey very, very well. These aren't what Maurice Wilson chose. No, Wilson chose something with its roots firmly back in the First World War. He went for the Haviland Gypsy Moth. The Gypsy Moth had first been designed back in 1925, so it had been around a while by the time Wilson got his. And even in 25, its biplane design made of wood and canvas wasn't really the most cutting edge technology. So why on earth did Wilson pick such a strange aircraft for his journey? With all of Maurice Wilson's trip up Mount Everest, he did really good research and he'd looked into the aircraft available to him that he could afford and the available aircraft that could do the trip. And in fact, he'd made a really good choice. Now, you might think it crazy thinking that this old fashioned biplane is a good choice, but I'll explain. Back when the Gypsy Moth had been released, it actually was a pretty good aircraft. And in those early years of its production, it had been quite successful. Back in 1926, 27 and 28, Gypsy Moth aircraft had won the King's Cup Air Race, a race around Britain, which was pretty prestigious prize of the time. But winning a smaller, maybe 1000 mile race around Britain is not the same as traveling halfway across the globe to fly up a mountain. But the Gypsy Moth had prior form on this as well. It all started in 1927, where Mary Bailey took her Gypsy Moth to a new all-time height altitude record. A year after her altitude test, Mary Bailey flew her Gypsy Moth from London's Croydon Airport all the way down to Cape Town in South Africa. It was an aircraft that had now proved itself to be able to do long distance flights but the Gypsy Moth wasn't done there. The aircraft really got a boost in 1929 when the Prince of Wales, later King Edward VIII, decided to buy himself one as his own personal plane. He would fly this around the country going to golf courses and that sort of thing and it became a bit of a fashion statement. A lot of the wealthy aviators decided to emulate the Prince of Wales by buying one of these Gypsy Moths. This may well have influenced our next aviator who set some records in a Gypsy Moth. This was a man called Francis Chichester buying himself a Gypsy Moth, Chichester flew from England to Australia in record time. He then modified his aircraft so that he could become the first pilot to fly over the Tasman Sea. This had not been done before because the distance was too great. From New Zealand, Chichester would head himself back up towards Japan. He was planning to do a full circuit of the earth in his Gypsy Moth, but unfortunately a crash in Japan stopped that. Another famous pilot to use the Gypsy Moth was Amy Johnson. She set many long distance flight records in her Gypsy Moth, 
Amy Johnson was the first female pilot to fly solo from England to Australia. It's a long and dangerous journey, but the aircraft had managed to do it perfectly well and Johnson became an aviating superstar. Another record Amy Johnson managed in a gypsy moth was a record flight from London to Moscow, which she covered in less than 21 hours. 1800 miles from London to Russia was pretty impressive, but Johnson wasn't finished there. From Moscow, she flew out over Siberia on her way to Japan, where she set another record going from London to Japan in record time. Amy Johnson's records became a milestone that many pilots tried to beat. One in particular, a lady named Jean Batten, decided she wanted to try and beat Johnson's London to Sydney flight. Jean's Batten story is quite an incredible one in itself and the Gypsy Moth features heavily. Now in 1930, Jean Batten wanted to learn to fly, but she didn't have the money to pay for the lessons needed to get the license, but she had a plan. There was a New Zealand RAF pilot that was quite sweet on her, a man named Fred Truman. Now Jean persuaded him to lend her the £500 that was needed to get the pilot's license. Once she'd done the required hours and had her ticket, well, she dumped Truman. You see, Truman couldn't afford to buy her an aeroplane, but there was another man who she thought could. A chap she'd met whilst flying called Victor Dory, well, he was quite wealthy, she thought. She persuaded him to borrow another £400 this time from his mother, which would buy her a Gypsy Moth aircraft. Jean Batten took this Gypsy Moth and set off for Australia in the hopes of beating Amy Johnson's record. She fell short of beating the record. On her second try, an engine failure forced her down and destroyed the aircraft. When she got back home to England, she tried to get old Victor to buy her a second aircraft, but he didn't have the money. So she dumped him as well. And this time it was the Castrol Oil Company who stepped up and bought her yet another Gypsy Moth. The aircraft Castrol Oil had bought for her was damaged in a crash. And so Jean returned to London with her damaged aircraft, where she went to her boyfriend. Edward Walters also had a Gypsy Moth aircraft. And so the wings were taken off of his, placed onto Jean's aircraft so that she could complete her flight to Australia. This time she made the distance in just 14 days, 22 hours. This was beating Amy Johnson's record by a full four days. All of this is happening in contemporary time to when Morris Wilson is looking at buying his aircraft. And so all of these long distance flights would have been in the record books and de Havilland, the company who made the Gypsy Moth, would have been telling Wilson about the achievements. It also meant that there were lots of modifications available to the Gypsy Moth ready for these long distance flights. Modifications such as a long range fuel tank which could replace the front seat of the aircraft. Wilson sat in the rear cockpit would be able to carry extra fuel which would help him cover those long distances between airfields. So although the Gypsy Moth looks rather unlikely, it was in fact a world beater in terms of long distance flight and record breaking achievement. In fact, the whole de Havilland Moth range is a bit of an impressive lineup. They've got a variety of different types of aircraft, all which carry the Moth name, because they all shared very similar components. The engines, the airframes, the wings, all had a design philosophy which you can definitely see link up. If I just run through the list, you'll see what I mean. We've got the Gypsy Moth, the Fox Moth, the Puss Moth, the Hornet Moth, the Leopard Moth, the Moth Miners and Moth Majors, and perhaps the most important of them all, the Tiger Moth. Now I said at the top of this programme that I was going to talk about one of the most important aircraft in British aviation history, and now we're at it, the Tiger Moth. Now you might wonder why the Tiger Moth would be such an important aircraft. And at first glance, well you're right, it doesn't look it. But sometimes appearances can be deceiving. The Royal Air Force bought the Tiger Moth in big numbers and started shipping these out to airfields all over the country, giving new pilots their first taste of flight. The Tiger Moth was the grounding for all of our Battle of Britain pilots. All of those pilots going out on bombing raids with Bomber Command, they all started flying the Tiger Moth. And so without this rather humble aircraft, we would not have had the calibre of pilots we needed during the Second World War. So when we talk about Maurice Wilson choosing an aircraft to go to Everest, well that's it, the Gypsy Moth. Perhaps a humble looking thing that wouldn't ever be considered able to do such amazing feats. And that goes for Maurice Wilson as well. I hope you've enjoyed the tale from my notebook all about Maurice Wilson's aircraft. And perhaps you can tune in again. I'll do another video sometime about the route he took and the flight from London to Everest and all that happens on that. So do make sure you subscribe to our History Tellers YouTube channel. Find us on Facebook and Twitter. 
and come back for more Tales from a Notebook another time.